the record that goes into the YouTube videos. So we left off here around, uh, I saved the slide, 218. Okay, good. This is ridiculously long, but like I said, that's why it took us a whole day to get through it. And the cryptography always slows people down a bit, but it is very important. And you know, we're not in a hurry here and we're not even required to necessarily cover everything. So answering the questions and having the discussion is really probably the main part. Are we still on day uh, two? Yeah, yeah, we're just finishing up uh, chapter three. Yeah, guys, we're just towards the end of this. We talked about the clipper chip and ended up around here. So. We talked about escrow encryption, where you're going to uh, pass the key on to some third party, which is already happening in the United Arab Emirates. And although people want it here, it hasn't happened yet. That you have to give the government all your keys. Uh, and a similar thing was Obama. One of his proposals was that the government would have all your passwords. He said, there's too much bother for people to remember all these passwords. You're going to have an official U.S. government password, which is all you need, and we'll handle all the authentication everywhere. And the next day, everyone said, oh, my God. God, what are you talking about? And he just let that one drop. That was like he also announced, we're going to go to Syria on the side of Assad because of uh, chemical weapons. And everyone said, are you out of your mind? They let that drop. It's, you would think that the president wouldn't just say stupid things, and, but, you know, Trump is the king of this. We're going to kick all the transgenders. Every day he says something stupid, and then tomorrow we say, well, we'll just pretend I didn't say that. I would think someone in a responsible position would have someone around them to say, you can't be doing that, especially when you're the commander-in-chief of the military. You can't be promising something and tomorrow just pretend you didn't say it. But anyway, we seem to be in that world. Uh, so the clipper chip was the uh, official piece of hardware that was supposed to be in everything to encrypt everything up to the government standards, which was DES. And so that's the game there. Anyway, um, this is apparently used a skipjack system. I didn't know about that. Anyway, this didn't go anywhere. It was the government's attempt to enforce a hardware thing. Steganography is a... Um, one thing about encryption, which I mentioned before, is um, if you encrypt your data, that does not hide the pen register data. Uh, this is a big issue. If you want to tap a phone call, you have to get a wiretap order, and for that, you have to have probable cause. But if you want the pen register data, you don't get the contents of the phone call. All you get is who called who at what time. And that is usually all you need. You don't get the contents of the phone call. You don't get the voice. You just get the billing information. This phone number connected to this phone number for this time. And that is usually all you need because that proves you have a conspiracy. It proves who you're talking to. And this is why, this is what China hacked Google for. This was the primary reason they hacked Google in 2010 because Google gets so many law enforcement requests to tell them about Gmail that they just put up a server with the pen register information for everybody's mail and they just gave law enforcement the ability to log in and just take it. And China wanted that database because all they wanted was who mailed who at what time, because what you do is you have a gang of conspiracy conspiring against the government or something, you arrest one of them, and all the rest will immediately contact all the rest to warn them, oh my God, the cops are coming. So you just all you need is that pen register data to find out who's in a conspiracy. And so that's an interesting issue here. So that means encryption does not really protect you. It does not protect, like I said, if you're at work and you're going to some forbidden site like Facebook, even if you're encrypting it, they can see the IP address you're going to. So they know who you're talking to unless you use a VPN. So steganography is when you want not only to conceal the contents of a message, you want to conceal the existence of a message. You don't want them to know you sent a message at all. So you hide a message in a picture or a video. And there's a second meaning to that picture that people don't know. And this is used by terrorists and some command and control center for botnets. They just know that the 10th kitten on Flickr is got a hidden message in it. You use and there are many ways to do it. This is what um, Anna Kornikova used, the spy in Russia. He had a uh, proprietary encryption team. It's very easy to make your own. And they got her computer with the program on it. That's how they found it. All you have to do is choose like the lesser bits of the color and have some pattern, like every third byte, the last bit counts or something like that. And uh, there's no easy way to tell. The only thing you can do is you can find a copy of the original image and the altered image, and you can tell that it has been altered a little. And that would be a clue, but it's actually... There's no general algorithm to undo steganography. There's a program called steganography, and there's various tools that will try to detect if one of the standard steganographic tools has been used, but it would be very easy to just write your own. Just modify a few bits in something and, um, and hide data in it. Anyway, so I got a few cahoots. Let's go to them, 4B3, come on, all right. So, Right. 
four B three is here. Okay. So how long should an RSA key be? Hmm. I don't know if you mentioned this, but it's an important fact to know. Okay, you need 2048 bits. 128 bits is totally not enough. And uh, this is an important fact, and it's kind of good to, I was puzzled by this for years. I only got it straight about five years ago. RSA uses public key encryption, and public key encryption is very different than private key encryption. 128 bits is enough for a private key like AES because the bits are random. Public key are not random. You cannot use all the bits. Like a public key has to be the product of two prime numbers and not all the numbers are prime. It is, and it has to be much longer. Remember one thing I said is the reason why you don't use public key encryption for everything is it is much slower. The keys are much longer. The math is much more complicated. It is hundreds of times slower or thousands of times slower than private key encryption, partly for this reason but the keys have to be 2048 bits now long. The original plan was going to be 512 bits long back when it was designed in like the seventies. But of course, computers got faster and the modern recommendation is 2048 or even 4096. Anyway, uh, that confused me for a long time. I was really puzzled. Some encryption said you had to be a thousand bits long and something a hundred bits long. And I said, one of these textbooks is wrong. And I finally got it straight. Public key encryption takes longer keys, at least for the prime number RSA ECC uses much shorter keys, like two or 300 bits, which are almost as short as the private key encryption. And that's why the NSA pushed it so much. If in other things being equal, ECC would be much cheaper to implement for the same level of security. Anyway, so what attack will defeat two deaths? <laughs> that's meet in the middle. You do one encryption with DES and you do a decryption with DES and you find where those two match. And now you have done two small calculations instead of one big one. So what attack deduces the key from electric power consumption? That's side channel, good. So what system ensures the authenticity of public keys? That's the public key infrastructure. That is the system of certificate authorities and all that gen intermediate authorities and all that jazz that creates that structure. What system uses AH and ESP? That's IPsec. Very complicated system. All right. So I got chapter three. It's still chapter three. So this is Jane and PC and Robert. All right. There's one more in chapter three. All right. So then there's perimeter defenses. Uh, this is, uh, you put something uh, for physical security. You put up fences. Little fences are a deterrent and large fences with barbed wire are preventive, so they actually make it difficult for people to climb over them. Um, there's ornamental gates and there's crash gates. There are various levels of gates. The crash gates, you can even crash a truck into them and it still won't penetrate the gate. So they're, of course, heavier and more expensive. 
bollards. I've learned in my CSSP training, bollards are these little sticks that you can all over the place just to stop people from driving cars on the sidewalks. And they're now considered essential at all buildings because since like the uh, bombing in like uh, Oklahoma City, people became aware that somebody would like to drive a truck full of explosive near your building and bring it down. So you just want to make them not able to drive near your building. So you got to have lights, of course. Lights are rated in how bright they are, and these can be detective or deterrent. This is why many companies leave the lights on at night and outside and everywhere, just so people can't hide as well. Your closed circuit TVs are, of course, a detective control, so you can see if people are doing bad things. Uh, the old systems were completely analog and live. Modern ones are more digital, but it doesn't really matter. And then you got locks, of course. <coughs> you can't sell the locks Americans use in Germany. No one is stupid enough to use them. I teach my students lock picking on the first day of the hacking class. It is incredibly easy. Average American locks to you, any a complete amateur that has never tried before in half an hour can learn to pick a normal five pin tumbler lock from Home Depot. That's what I do. I buy them and I teach my students how to pick them. If you go to any hacking conference, there's a lock pick village. It is amazing and it's really important to everyone to learn this because you shouldn't, nobody should use them. In Germany, nobody uses D locks. They have better locks. We could buy better locks and use them. But not enough people understand how useless these locks are. You lock the door, you think nobody's going in there. That is manifestly not true. If you just try it all, you're lift, the reason is you're lifting five pins to the right level to hit the shear line. And the reason why it's easy to pick them is because you make them cheap. They have, uh, they're not perfectly the right length. They're not perfectly straight. So you don't have to accurately hit the shear line. You just have to get kind of close. So you can even pick a lock just by taking a wire and bending it randomly and just jerking it around in there. By just random luck, you'll hit the right combination before long. And that's what the cops use, lockpick guns. It's just a ratchet. And that's because they're very sloppily made and you do not have to very precisely line anything up to make them work. There are better locks for sale, but there's not a rating on the lock. So people can tell this lock is secure, this lock is junk. There ought to be but there isn't. And that's why a lot of people want to put security ratings on IOT devices. It would be nice to know this webcam is cheap. This webcam here has a higher security rating though. If people could tell, they might buy it. The way they buy things like Dolphin Safe Tuna and you know, they, if they could only tell which one is better, they might be willing to pay the additional cost to make a better product. So lock picking is where you um, just reach in with a little wire and lift the pins one by one until they hit the shear line. And the point is you put a little bit of tension on the lock. So it's trying to unlock and then you lift one pin. One of these pins is the one that is going to catch first. And when you get that pin to the right height, the lock turns a little bit and it sticks. Now you find the next pin and lift it and you, you can open the lock that way. You really, it's the same as like the meet in the middle attack. Instead of having to raise all five pins to the right level, you only have to raise one pin to the right level and then one more pin to the right level. And that takes a difficult problem and turns it into an easy problem. All right, so there's bump keys or one simple solution. You just shave every key down to the lowest position and now you just tap it with a screwdriver, tap, 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 tap. And the vibration causes the pins to bounce and they randomly hit the right location. Uh, that's the another low skill technique. Uh, at DEF CON about five years ago, a guy showed a 12 year old girl how to pick the lock on the White House. The White House has $900 triangular key locks and he figured out how to make a bump key for that lock. And he showed her tap, 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 opening the lock and made a video and the manufacturer was so caught flat footed, they just lied and said, oh, that must've been an altered lock. So I mean, it, this it's so bad Awareness is so bad that in America, either high expensive, high security locks are also crap. And it really is a shame. Um, so that's why I think it's a very good idea to teach everybody lock picking so they become aware of this. And at some point, it will humiliate the lock or companies enough that they will actually start selling good locks. Right now, um, some of the lock picking experts do tell you which locks to buy, and they're not even more expensive. But there are recommendations of ones that are hard to pick. Uh, so there are master keys in some companies that will open all the all the doors and uh, core keys or something you use to remove the core of a lock. And then there's these combination locks, these things. These things are pretty much security theater. They look like they have 32 things around, but really in there, there's just a few gears. And so there's a bunch of mathematical tricks here. You can go on YouTube. Um, all you have to do is pull the casp and turn it to where it catches with the friction. There's actually something in there with only like eight sides that catches at a certain point and you can find a couple of catching points and do a little math and find the combination. If you just feel 
where it catches, you get enough information to lower the combination down to one of eight possibilities. So uh, you can also open by pounding with a hammer in the right place and stuff, and you can open it by breaching it with a thin piece of metal with a shim and bending back the, the catch. There's, you know, these things stop people who are children or who aren't even trying, but they don't stop anybody serious. So smart cards are the electronic equivalent. You have a little card with a mag stripe on it or a chip, and it reads that. And so this is now uh, what the military uses and high security organizations. The advantage of this is you can have a separate one issued to each employee. So if you want to fire one employee, you can deactivate their card without having to replace all the rest, which is another huge problem with this kind of lock. Because once you give people keys, you don't know if they've made more copies of the keys. And if you fire one person, you can't remove that one person from the authorized list without replacing all the keys, which is expensive. So the smart cards make it much better to really handle the real business use. And it also, you can keep a record of who opened the door and who was in there. And now if a bad thing happens, you know who to blame. So those are all good things. There's the common access control, US Department of Defense smart card. All right. Uh, so following someone through a door, when they open it, you follow them through. That's piggybacking. This is what turnstiles are supposed to prevent. Uh, what you really have to do to stop this is you have to tell your employees they can't do it, and you actually have to send spies to try doing this and then punish them if they let them through. Um, that's generally the case with social engineering. Uh, one of Some of the pen testing companies will fish your employees. One of the guys I know does this, and he writes phishing emails and fishes his own employees, and if they click on the link, then... Uh, what he found, what he, did, he used to try punishing the people who clicked on the link, and what they found was that didn't really help. What really helped was instead of having like a prize and an award for people who didn't fall for it. This is what people that train animals and stuff do. So, you know, be, punishing an animal for doing the wrong thing is not as effective as rewarding them for doing the good thing. And so uh, he has like a contest where you have like every every month there's like five or ten traps he sets on the network, sending emails and putting up web pages and seeing if people will do the dumb thing. And there's a prize for the person who like does best at not falling into these traps. And there's also, if he sends out a phishing email, the way you really win is you report it to your security department. Hey, this looks fishy. Then you get a lot of points. So that's how you train your staff to be aware and they should know what to do and you should reward them for doing it. Otherwise, if somebody's doing something suspicious, nobody knows what to do. Like there's these signs all over. If you see something, say something, but like what do you tell? What do you do? You have to make it clear at your company that people know what to do when they see a security breach. So you can detect forbidden things and so on with your contraband checks. Motion detectors, of course, we all know about. The cheap ones are infrared. There's various other types. These things are actually entertaining. It worked at my college. There's a standard technique that pen tests you use to penetrate physical security at buildings, which works like this. The, you can lock all the doors in the building, but to meet fire safety insurance regulations, they consider what if somebody accidentally gets locked in the building? There has to be some way for them to get out. So if somebody tries to walk out of the locked building, there's a motion detector that will open the door. So all you have to do is shine a light in or spray some smoke in or take a balloon and slide it in so it goes, <laughs> get motion inside the building and the door will open. Well, you can use a piece of paper underneath the door and now do it. Yeah. I did it. At my college, we were able to take a, a, a plastic bag. One day on Saturday, there's nobody around. So my students and I went to break into the science building while nobody was around. We found all these ways in. We took a coat hanger and stuck a plastic bag on it and stuck it in and shook it around and that opened the door. There's, this is a common trick. There was a guy, um, one of the pen testers did this. He was going to a conference. He came out, he'd been drinking. He had a glass of whiskey and there was a bank. And he took a swig of whiskey and went up to the gap and spit in the bank and opened the door. So, you know, it's, um, it's entertaining stuff. Um, all right. So then there's uh, alarms, of course, on the windows and doors. This is a good idea. So when people leave, you really make sure they've actually closed and locked all the doors and the alarm won't go on if they didn't. Uh, your hinges should be inside so that people can't remove the pins, you know, this sort of thing. Um, all right. Windows, there's different levels of glass that are harder to break out there. And your walls have to be all the way. These walls are probably the typical fake walls that only go part way up and there's a fake ceiling. You could probably move these tiles and climb through into the next room. So it's a weird thing to be aware of that unless your walls go all the way up, you haven't really separated this room from the next room. And uh, then you have guards, of course. There's all different kinds of guards. Um, the am most guards are not supposed to fight with people. They're just supposed to report it to someone else. But you, if you're the military, of course, you might have guards that are actually ready to fight and shoot people. Um, 
then you have dogs. Dogs are extremely effective. Burglars really don't like dogs. Most pen testers really don't like dogs. Dogs are very alert and it's not easy to fool them. And you know, most people are, do not appreciate dogs. Dogs are a good security barrier. Of course, there are ways around them. You can just put like meat with tranquilizer in them or something or, or kill the dog or something. Most people are not willing to go there. Um, and so in general, they find it people easier to fool than dogs. So um, you can have people using fidget badges and uh, have everyone know what visitor badges mean. I know at DEF CON, you get badges and there are all these different kinds of badges. And one big scandal at DEF CON was if you're the press, they give you a really distinctive colored badge. So everybody knows you're the press because at DEF CON, there are a small number of real criminals who are in hiding. And there's a large number of extreme privacy advocates that feel very strongly that they don't want any pictures of them taken. I, I'm at a DEF CON and I met people at B-Sides, who were the official bank security officers for major banks that came to talk to me. And they said, my boss can never know I was here. I'm not allowed to give a talk. I have to use a fake name. My company would fire you if you went to some evil hacker conference, which I think is outrageously short-sighted, but that's the way it is. A lot of people are hiding their presence at this conference, and it is really not okay. If you took a photograph and put it on Twitter, they could get fired for that. So you have to identify that you're the press. And somebody from like NBC News a woman tried to get in and use a normal badge, and not a press badge, and they threw her out. And it was a big, big scandal. They tried to sneak in undercover. So, you know, that's the same thing at your company. Your visitors are supposed to be marked so everybody knows, oh, that's a visitor. Don't let them see the secret stuff. Anyway, um, all right. So you got topography. You should consider, you know, the landscaping. Is there, like, some way to hide near the building because you let trees or a, a gully or something get up near your building? Um, you can mark data centers. You typically do not mark data centers. I, I worked at an escrow agency and we had a location where we were processing information for payment, but we didn't have any walk-in business. It was all mail and fax, and it was in an old Bank of America. And every now and again, we'd get somebody who thought it was a bank coming in. And every now and then, we'd get an angry claimant that said, oh, I want my money. I'm going to come to your place and beat people up and shoot people to get the money. And the idea was they couldn't tell where we were. There was no name on the door. There's no oh, obvious entrance. It should just look like an anonymous building. That's usually what you want. Um, wiring closets, this is amazing. Everywhere I go, there's like wiring closets just hanging open and routers just sitting out in the open. And that's of course nuts, it probably here too. Yeah, well that's probably just for classroom use. But you know, many places I go, there's just this routers and switches just hanging out in the open. And of course that's crazy. One company I worked, every person came in the door and every day you would walk past the main server console just sitting there and I walk past, couldn't someone just type on that? And they totally could, <laughs> you know, anyway. Um, all right, you've got to have your media stored somewhere. You have to have offsite backup. You can't have backup tapes in the same building because if the building burns down, you'll lose them. You have to somehow back them up offline. One popular choice is to back them up on the internet. But if you have a lot of data, the internet connection may be too slow and you may prefer to have removable hard drives or something or tapes that you take somewhere, but you have to take them off site and you have to encrypt them and secure them. One thing I argued with my companies a lot about, and I was not able to succeed much at that time, was to convince them to encrypt their backups. I said, dude, if someone steals the backup tape, you're hosed. It's a data breach. But they didn't take it seriously. They just thought about the backup as a emergency recovery feature. They didn't think about the backup as a valuable item and so they would just give it to like some low-paid employee oh please take this somewhere they put it in their car and forget it and everything because it doesn't really matter but it does matter anyway yeah that's well yeah you make a business decision how often to make backups um the old rule when you decide the rule is you decide how much work you would like to do over if you're willing to do a whole week of work over then you only need to back up once a week uh, so that might be for home users, but for businesses, you typically back up every day. And for really valuable business words like stock markets, you back up continuously. With the second copy is continuously updated or every hour or something, you, you make a strategy to decide um, how, ex how much work could you do over. That's, that's all it is. Yeah, I worked yeah. stock exchange first job. Yeah. Uh, three copies, um, they have two sites, and one take. They ship it to some place they call it IML, whatever it is. It's an off site storage. Nobody yeah. knows where that is. So That's right. Three copies of the <coughs> I worked there from 98 to 2000. Yeah. And you know, Microsoft was starting with Server 2003. 
they added um, previous versions tab to files so that because the number 98% of all backup restoration is from human error. It's not that something broke, it's somebody accidentally deleted a file. So Microsoft made, every starting with XP and Server 2003, it keeps backups. And it, by the way, Dropbox keeps 30 days of backups of everything. You delete something from your Dropbox, you can log into the website and find up to 30 days of backups. This is awesome for crime investigation forensics. People can delete their files and it's all on the server and they don't know that. And the cloud is awesome for this. And by the way, we remember that San Bernardino iPhone that made a huge scandal where the FBI wanted in. Well, the fact is the iPhone might be encrypted, but iCloud is not. And iCloud, by the way, is Apple iCloud is stored on, micro, on, Amazon, on Microsoft Azure, which is a funny thing. And I'm not surprised they don't advertise it, but I guess it must be built because Apple can't run servers worth a damn. They have to rent server space because they don't have an Apple cloud that works very well. So anyway, and that stuff is encrypted, but it's encrypted with the key that Apple has. So if you send a search warrant to Apple, they can give you the contents of iCloud and everybody is backing up their phone in iCloud and they're constantly pop up trying to get you to do it. So in a way, it's kind of stupid for the FBI to make a huge big deal by getting in the phone because almost always they can just get it out of the cloud. But of course, if you turn off iCloud, then you really could put something on the phone and there might not be another copy, but I think not that many people are that savvy to do that. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. I would think even more than once a day these days because I'm thinking what would happen if customers are buying things and you're sending the payment somewhere and then you lose the information so you don't send them the product, I would find that unacceptable. Even one day of it, I would want to have basically continuous backup. And it seems like on the internet, you could pretty easily have that, just another copy of everything. Anyway, um, at least the critical stuff. So you, in defense in depth strategy, you'll have more defenses on things. So you have asset tracking where you know what your hardware is and you keep track of whether people are stealing it, and whether your employees are walking off with it. You can restrict USB ports and network ports to only allow authorized devices. So you know, people aren't wandering in and connecting their laptop and getting on the network and such. Um, you have to control the environment, of course. You don't want it to be too hot. You don't want the power to have a failure in power that causes your servers to crash and such. Uh, so you have to have surge protectors and uninterrupted power supplies and generators to provide power when it fails. And you have to consider electromagnetic interference. Of course, the wires leak to other wires. So if your wires go too close to fluorescent uh, lights and you did not use shielded wires, then you'll have bits lost on that transmission line. Uh, fiber optics is one good answer there, although it's expensive. It's immune to electromagnetic interference. And you have to control the humidity and temperature of the data center and other places. So you've got uh, various recommendations here. One thing Google did, Google, the old wisdom was your server room should be really cold, like 60 degrees or something. And Google actually did a test and they found out it's okay for it to be 90 degrees. So they save a lot of money on air conditioning and the Google people, normal people in server room are wearing coats, but Google people are wearing like shorts and flip flops because it's much warmer than it used to be because they did the test and they said, you know, it really doesn't cause that many more failures to let it be a lot warmer. Anyway, but they also build their own servers out of chosen components that so may not be true in general. Yeah. Yeah, so he was just telling me that car, oh, there's a car cable now, the new one. <coughs> they, are, they, they don't have plastic coverings. They have soy based, soy land coverings. Soy? Soy, made out of soy. So a lot of rodents would chew cables in the cars now. Yeah, I don't know why they wouldn't. Economically or environmentally yeah, the, the, friendly. Yeah, eco friendly. Okay, yeah, so don't so, use soybeans. Yeah, new cars yeah. are 2019 yeah. <laughs> 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 And that happened to our building uh, three years ago. Yeah. Uh, all the rodents chewed everything. So when we came at 8 o'clock class, nothing was working. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> and and yeah. they had just put in new cables. Yeah, I know when they lay the undersea cables for the telephone network, they had to put a metal guard in it so the sharks wouldn't chew through the cable. That's a problem. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, um, all right. Then, of course, you got static electricity and corrosion if you let the humidity get too low or too high. And you've got dust and other smoke and other things you got to keep out of the computer room or it'll mess up the equipment. Um, 
And so there's heat detectors, like I guess we've got some kind of sprinkler in there, it looks like. Uh, some of these just detect heat because there's like wax that will melt and leak the water out. Some of them detect ionization with like a radioactive particle. Um, and some of them detect uh, smoke by shining infrared light, but you know, somehow I have to have a fire detector for uh, that will do something. Although usually spraying a bunch of water in your server room is not what you want. So usually you have an alternate there, like put in a CO2 gas or something to stop the fire or halon or something. So you have to have evacuation routes and fire drills so people know how to get out of there and you figured out how to move people out without elevators, even if they're handicapped and all that jazz, just basic safety and emergency warning systems. I think it's kind of funny at, at my city, at city college, they have an outdoor emergency warning system and they test it every week and you can never understand the thing it says. It says, it doesn't a real emergency. Every week they test it. I never understand the word it says and they seem to call that a successful test. But anyway, um, they do that too, yes. Those I can read. So that might actually do some good, but the horn is not doing any good I can detect. Anyway, um, here's the tire extinguishers are out there. A is just water for normal wooden plastic. The most important one is uh, computer rooms. Electrical is C. That's the main thing that matters for us. You should use a C type tire extinguisher on electrical equipment. All right. So you can, uh, the, the fire suppression, there's water is type A where you just put out burning paper and wood and buildings. Um, CO2 is dangerous, halon is considered better, um, but now they use argon or FM200 because halon defeats the ozone layer, so they're removing halon-based fire extinguishers and replacing them with more environmentally friendly gases. Um, you may have a countdown before you do this so people can evacuate, and um, there's various kinds of water sprinkler systems that have, the pipe might be full of water or not full of water. There's various different systems to influence the response time and the likelihood of a false leak. Anyway, the usual, that's one aspect of physical availability is to protect you from that kind of disaster. And that's why if you um, want to prove that you have enough experience for a CISSP, if you have experience in physical security, being a security guard, that counts. Because physical security is one of the domains. These kind of issues, how to lock the doors, how to suppress the fires and all that jazz. I, uh, the techno geeks might say that is stuff that doesn't matter, but that is included. That is an aspect of security. Just like personnel security is, HR, background checks, verifying their resume, that's all part of the CISSP. All right, so it is 4B4, this one right here, okay? <clears throat> It's really pretty easy to meet the experience requirement if you've been working professionally in IT. Almost every job role can be more or less interpreted to fit in these domains. You have to have five years of full time in at least two of the eight domains. I think that's it. I think we only have five cahooters. <clears throat> okay, so which one of these is a deterrent? <clears throat> that's a three-foot fence. Um, these other things are actually prevented. The wallage actually means you can't drive up there, and the eight-foot fence means you really can't drive up there. The three-foot fence just reminds people that they shouldn't walk up there. It doesn't stop them. Anyway, if you shave a key down to the lowest position, what have you got? <laughs> this works for cars too. You can just take a car key and shave it down to the bottom of it. My student had his car stolen that way. And I got a bunch of car lock picks. And they're, the only thing about cars is they have bumps on both sides. So you have to have a pick that is like, got two little lumps and sort of a spring loaded thing in the middle. It spreads apart like a V, so you pick both sides at once. That's the only difference. A smart card, what's that? The ICC is a smart card. That's the government-issued smart card. A lot of smart cards aren't mag stripes. They use other systems. Mag stripe is one option. So which fire extinguisher is just water? 
although it's not the most common way to do it, you can do it with just water. And which countermeasure prevents EMR? That's fiber optics use pulses of infrared light and elect out electrical signals outside do not interfere with it at all. They also use them in nuclear power plants because nuclear radiation does not interfere at all, although it does tend to cloud the glass. Um, but like industrial plants with a lot of electromagnetic interference, fiber optics is a good option. So that's the end of chapter three. There's PC and Robert and B. All right, good. And we started at nine, so I guess we can just move on to chapter four. Aha, someone has joined us. Everyone is welcome. All right, and let's move on to chapter four, which is here. Okay, so there's communication and network security. This is essentially the net plus part. Let me encourage this Kahoot thing to get out of the way, or whatever that is, a Zoom thing. All right, so basic network concepts that hopefully are familiar to folks from Cisco or Net Plus. So simplex is communication only one way, like broadcast TV. You can't send anything to the TV station, you're just receiving it. Half duplex is like walkie talkies where you can talk or receive, but only one at a time. You have to hold down the button and talk, then the other person has to hold down the button and talk and you take turns. Full duplex is much better what we have now. Almost everything is this, so both people can talk and listen at the same time, and it's like being in a physical room with people. Um, yeah. 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 Sorry. I was in a hotel about 60 years ago, and if you wanted to be wired, they said, do you want to flex, have to flex, Okay, I understood that. But looking at this, and I'm like, an average person in a hotel mm -hmm. 15 years ago, yeah. like, and there was nothing. It was an engineer who wrote to this, and you have to choose which one to get into that. Yeah. <laughs> yes, and this is, of course, what you were saying. This is the usability problem in the modern internet, like those stupid GE bulbs. A normal person who just wants a light bulb suddenly has to understand this baffling complexity for why. <laughs> yeah. we, we seem to have really moved away from making things usable and considering the experience of the end user and treating everybody like they're an engineer. Yeah, that's why, I mean, I had a problem, but all my, all my students had the same problem. I never got to talk to anybody in my family because every Thanksgiving and everything, I would spend all day fixing their computers until I told them all to buy Macs. And now I can actually talk to them because I've discovered an ordinary human cannot operate a Windows PC. It's constantly infected. Stuff is popping up. It's asking questions they don't understand. They're lost just constantly. And Macs, they can operate. Macs can actually be used by a normal human and they're pretty much okay. They cost a lot more, but they're worth it for most people. Anyway, um, so baseband is where the entire frequency available is dedicated to one signal. That's what Ethernet is. You have a wire, and you are the only user of that wire. Your computer can use all the frequencies available in the wire. Broadband is where many people are sharing the same communication channel. So this is like AM radio or FM radio, where you have different signals going down the same thing. So each of them only has a certain bandwidth they can use, and then somebody else uses the next one. Analog is the system where you have a continuously varying signal and you detect at the other end, and it is not precise or copyable, reproducible. This is like vinyl records. There's a groove in the vinyl which simulates the music, and as you play it, it degrades every time you play it. And if you make a copy, the copy is not quite as good as the original, and so on. Digital is the alternative where you store it as a mathematical series of zeros and ones. And now you can have a hash value or an error correction code so you can make a copy and you can verify that the copy is 100% correct. And so it is possible to have any number of copies that are exactly like the original, which is not possible with analog signals. So you have LANs, networks within a building, MANs, WANs, and GANs, and PANs are different networks up to the internet, which is the global network of networks. Um, Intranet is a privately owned network, which may span some geographical distance, but it's not open directly to the public. It's only open to the people inside a company. This is what people now call a private cloud, 
where you have something that's accessible from multiple locations, but only after you prove you're an employee of the company, that's something like a VPN. Um, and then you have extranets that connect you to your business partners, but not generally to the whole internet. Circuit switching is the old system where they had these phone operators sitting there plugging you in, you make a call and they would connect you to a pair of wires and that wire was used by only one call. As long as it went, there were only so many wires and if you wanted to make an overseas call, you had to wait for it. Um, switching to packet switching is much, much better because now many people can share the same physical wire by sending packets. So you mix one phone call or internet traffic with another. This makes it possible to send many signals down the same wire and that makes phone calls and internet traffic much, much cheaper. Of course, it's less secure. This is why in the old days of copper wires and analog phones and 56K modems, you did not need a VPN because you had a physically private network. This was one security measure was to make people use a dial-up computer to connect because then they would have one wire exclusively for them. It's not a shared circuit, so it's very hard for anyone to tap. But now that we're all mixed together on the same internet, you can steal other people's signals in the coffee house, at the router, at the switch, all over the place, and now you need some level of encryption to have privacy. So quality of service is a big issue because you have many signals moving down the wire and some of them are time sensitive and some are not. For example, voice over IP for like cell phone calls, that's why one of um, voice over IP people said the greatest thing that ever happened to them is cell phones. In the 60s and 70s, when people used analog phones where you had a copper wire, voice quality was actually very good. And people demanded really high, good sounding phone calls. And when cell phones came out, they had this scratchy, distorted phone, and people got used to that. Voice over IP is the scratchy, low quality stuff. And they said, we never would have been able to make voice over IP if people had continued to demand the quality they had in the 60s with those analog phone calls. It would have been too expensive. So it's an issue, but anyway, people can detect something like a 50 millisecond gap in a voice in a voice. So it is not acceptable for the voice traffic to be waiting for the internet traffic. You have to give it higher priority. And QoS is one system for that. And there are a bunch of others to prioritize traffic on wires. This is why um, one thing the um, rebels and privacy advocates have always said is we need internet, um, not no filtering the internet. They call it, uh, I forget, there's a, a term for it. Uh, where you do not have priorities on the internet, you don't block anything, uh, unfiltered internet, there's a net neutrality. This is, I've never understood this, there never has been net neutrality. Everybody filters the traffic. They block the malware, they block certain things, they prioritize certain things or other things. The net, what they want is to make it so that Google doesn't let the Gmail through and block the hotmail to make money, which is totally what Comcast has done and got caught doing it, Verizon has got caught doing it, um, but that's not net neutrality. They want to have some violation of abuse of uh, a monopoly position or something. Anyway, um, everybody has to filter and prioritize traffic on the network and block certain traffic and delay certain traffic. So you got a layered design. Um, so there's a network model. This is the OSI model with the TCP IP model of the different layers of network traffic and addressing. And then you have a network stack at each end, which is the layers of software and hardware used in your devices. So here's the OSI model. Uh, there's some common mnemonics for it, like all people seem to do data processing. This is the seven layer model that most people learn. It is came from Europe and it's actually not the way hardware is actually built. The bottom four layers are absolutely real. If you take system, you totally learn which hardware does these, those really matter. The top three layers have no real distinction in practice. In practice, something like your web browser does all three layers and it's all mixed together. And it's pretty much a pedantic exercise to worry about whether you're layer five, six or seven but the bottom four layers have very strong meaning. The physical layer is the physical connection of wires or radio signals. The data link layer has ethernet addresses. The network layer has IP addresses and the fourth layer has TCP or, IP or UDP ports. So there's real meaningful addressing and information and content at the bottom four layers and different hardware handling those layers. So those are real and they really matter. The other three are pretty much blurred together in practice. So layer one is where you have bits moving from one place to another, down a cable or, or a wireless device, and this is where hubs and repeaters and cables are. Layer two, you have uh, MAC addresses. So this is data moving on a local area network, not to the internet, but up to the router. Um, it's used to route traffic locally. And at um, this has two sub layers, the media access control layer and the logical link control layer. 
And network layer is what moves across the globe to find the physical location of the device at the other end. So this is IP addresses, which go into a global routing table. And ultimately, even though we might have private addresses in this room, the college as a whole has to have a gateway with a public address, which can only, and those are like public phone numbers. You have to pay for it and it has to be unique so they can find you anywhere. And that's what goes on here. IP version version four and IP version six and routers are used to move traffic to the physical location of the device at the other end. And once you get there, you don't, the fourth layer gives you a port number, which tells you which specific process on that device you're using, because you might have multiple windows open on your laptop and you don't know which window to send the data to until you have the port number. <clears throat> TCP is reliable and slow for that reason because it sends a little data and then it waits for an acknowledgement and sends some more and waits for an acknowledgement. So there are many round trip times required. This is why it takes much longer to download a big file over TCP than UDP. UDP just spits out the data whether you're listening or not like broadcast television at full speed. This also means you have flow control with TCP. If you have a weak device like a cell phone and a powerful device like a Google server and you download a file with TCP, it will come no faster than the recipient can take it because Google will send a little data and then wait for an acknowledgement and a little more and wait for an acknowledgement. But if it was UDP, it would just be spitting it out. And if you can't absorb it at that rate, you'd just be hosed. So the session layer is um, where you have a authenticated session, like you've logged in and you know who you are, that sort of thing, like a network file share where you have authenticated and now you have access to get in. Uh, the presentation layer converts data from one format to another, like unzipping compressed image formats like GIF and JPEG or, or undoing encryption. And the application layer is where you have human readable data, like an email or a video or an image. Most users do everything in the application layer. They see a video, they see a web page, they click on something. And then as far as they're concerned, by magic, that goes to another phone. It goes down through the seven layers, through the wire, up through the seven layers, and they don't know any of that. Those are for engineers to figure that out. Normal users live all at layer seven. All right, so that's the net plus, or most of the net plus here. All right, so that's the stuff that the management people greatly fear, and there's more of that coming, net plus and the A plus, you know. So this is 4A1, I guess. Must be 5A1, all right. Let's see what we get here. Is there a 5A1? All right, let's see. Maybe I can't find my cahoots. And I see 125. If this works. All right. Well, maybe I don't have these first set of cahoots available. I may have to just skip them. I'll make a little more of an attempt to find them, but uh, I thought I had these all set for today, but apparently I have missed one. You see it? Oh, there it is. Thank you. Good. Huh. I don't know how I failed to find it before. Good. All right. Well, let's see if I can. What is this nonsense? Okay. Uh, hey, guys. Well, this is them harassing me for not having paid. All right. Um, you see, let's try CNET 125. All right, and 5A1 was available somewhere. Do you see it? There it is, good, okay. All right, good, thank you. Like I say, they don't let me sort stuff. Maybe I'm gonna have to start paying their $3 a month or whatever it is. I have so many of these, it's getting out of hand. You can't sort it or put it in folders until you pay them a fee. The free version is what I'm using. I have hundreds of these things now. I should probably start paying the fee. <coughs> the other thing I could do is be organized and have a better naming convention. I could sort them better. But I wrote them over the years, and I, I'm not very consistent and organized. I think five is the number. So what transmissions go through an Ethernet cable? <laughs> Space band, all the 
bandwidth is available to one chip. That's what that means. Nobody else is sharing it. So what layer has MAC addresses? Layer two, good. All right. What layer has hubs? You don't see hubs that much anymore, but right. hubs are layer one. They just send the signal out without yes. No, they don't even look at the MAC address. They just send the signal out every other port. It comes in on port one, they send they don't even interpret anything. They're stupid. They're like crossover cables. Yeah. That's why they're pretty much extinct. So what layer has network file share? That's five or six up there where it's hard to tell them apart. Okay. All right. So that's the start of chapter four. I got Robert for three and PC for three and B for three. Okay, good. All right. And it's about 10. I think we'll do one more of these and then take a break. That seems to be about right. Taking a break around 10, 15 seems to more or less work. So there's a TCP IP model, which is the European model that we learn and love. And then there's the uh, USI model. And there's the TCP IP model, which is actually the way hardware really is. The network access, the internet transport, an application. Uh, that's more or less the way it is in the real world. Um, all right. So, uh, the network access layer combines layers one and two, so it has the physical wire and the MAC address. <clears throat> and uh, internet layer is layer three, where you have IP addresses and routing. And transport layer is the same, where you have TCP and UDP. And then the application layer is just everything above it, which, like I say, in reality, you might as well do that, because the distinction is hard to keep straight and not really used much in practice. <laughs> Encapsulation is what's used here. You have data, and to move down to the next layer, you put it in a container and add an address, and put it in a container and add an address, and there's three layers of addresses on every packet. It's easiest to see in Wireshark. That's one of the reasons why my Network Plus class, I always make, put them in Wireshark early on so they learn this. So um, at the highest level, you have segments. A large thing like a email is broken up into segments of the right size, and then the address is labeled put on each one. That's segmentation at layer four. Then it goes to layer three and encapsulated in a packet with an IP address to go to the physical location of the destination. And then when it gets to the destination router, it is put on the local area network and encapsulated at layer two with an Ethernet address to get to the local device. And then it is sent over layer one as bits. So those are the encapsulations. So if you want to memorize them, here's the old Cisco thing, SPF 10, like a sun protection factor. Um, segment per packet frame and one and zero. Those are the um, protocol data units at the different segment layers. So people talk about TCP packets and they are wrong. It should be TCP segments and IP packets. But only, as far as I know, only CCNAs care and know the difference. Everybody else throws these words around at random because they don't really understand the difference or care. So decapsulation is what happens at the other end. You get something with many addresses in front and you remove, you get the bits, you turn them into frames, then you strip off the MAC address and turn them into packets, then you strip off the IP address and turn them into segments, then you combine all the segments and pass that data up to the high level thing, which now has a readable file that no longer contains any address information. Just like you open an envelope and only take the contents and give it to your boss and they don't really care about the zip code and the postmark and everything that's on the outside of the envelope. So, all right, uh, MAC addresses are burned in at the factory, but what's actually used on the network is a software copy of this that can be modified. And um, as a privacy measure, almost every major operating system now randomizes the MAC address. I think Mac has announced this, Linux has announced it, even Windows, I think, just announced that the next update to Windows 10 will start randomizing MAC addresses. Um, so you cannot track them as easily. Um, but originally the plan was you would keep using this MAC address um, forever that was assigned at the factory and it would be globally unique. But yeah. It will. You know, it's a very relevant question. Port security, the simplest port security works by MAC addresses. And so <laughs> if your operating system starts randomizing, you're going to have a problem. Absolutely. So you'd have to turn off that feature in a port security environment or somehow register the devices in some other channel? It's a very good question. 
I, I don't know. That's going to be a problem when Windows starts doing it. But there is no way to, to detect what physical place that came from there? Is that, uh, sorry, there, well, no, there, the no, the packet contains a MAC address, but you have no way to verify it. Yeah. Yeah. If they, you could randomize it, and and well, you do have to maintain it for the duration of a connection. When you're found by ARP, you have to keep using the same MAC address as long as you're talking. But if you reboot the machine tomorrow and it's a different address, everything will work fine, unless you have port security. Like you say, you have some list of approved MAC addresses, in which case it would no longer be approved. So. Yeah, wireless routers often use that. So if you want to use MAC address authentication, you would have to turn off the randomization. And of course, there will be an option in the operating system to turn it off. But because the normal use case of people is to carry their laptop, she, this is, I think, largely a response to an Apple uh, privacy scandal, which has been around for years, and I don't think Apple has fixed it yet. If you turn on an iPhone, Apple's decided to violate the standard protocol. If you connect an iPhone to a wireless access point in a coffee house, it does not do the standard DHCP handshake to get an address. What Apple devices do is the first thing they attempt to do is to use the last five addresses they have used and just connect with them. And so if you go back to a place that you go frequently, it will connect faster. That is the goal. But this means if you just turn on Wireshark in a coffee house, you will get the five MAC addresses that every Apple device has previously connected to. So you can stalk people and find their homes and find their work by this because those MAC addresses are indexed on the internet. There's, you can just type a MAC address into Google and it will tell you the physical location of where that router is. So that's a problem. And that's why I think there's been a lot of effort increasingly as time goes forward. There's another reason too. Um, some IPv6 versions assign your IPv6 address, including the MAC address in the IPv6 address. And that's actually sent to the destination. So that seriously violates your privacy. Now the IP address tells not only your location, but the complete identity of your machine. So there's an increasing desire to randomize that unique identifier. Um, now Vladimir Putin said, we should just end anonymity on the internet. Every computer should have a serial number included in every package so we know who's saying everything all the time. And that would get rid of malware and pornography and spam and political dissidents and all these rotten things we don't want happening. And the RIAA, of course, totally agrees. They want to know who's downloading the movie and make sure that you paid for it. And the MAC address is the logical thing to do for that, use for that. So there are two people pushing on this. But right now, there is no unique identifier of your machine that is transmitted to the other end. And a bunch of people would like to change that. But so far, we're moving in the direction of more privacy and having less and less of any unique identifier in the traffic. That is the faction that has won at the technical level in America, although I think no longer at the political level. Anyway, so IPv4 has these 32-bit addresses like this, 192.168.1.0. For some ungodly reason, they chose to make it four base 10 numbers from 0 to 255. So 30 years of network engineers all had to learn to convert base 10 to base 2 in their head and get good at it, which everyone suffers greatly about, but you get used to it. And IP version 6, they finally knocked it off and just made it hexadecimal. So this is the IPv4 header. You've got a version here, which is always four, and then you've got a source and destination address of 32 bits each, and you have other things here, like this ungodly fragment thing. You can have fragmentation at layer three, which turns out to be inefficient, insecure, and a terrible idea, and they removed it in IP version six. So that's fragmentation here. You can, uh, there's a product called Frag Router. You'll find it in Kali, where you can break every packet up into little chunks with only eight bytes of data in each packet, and now your network, um, Defense systems cannot reassemble it to realize it's a virus or something. If they did, it would slow everything down. So, you know, it's that I, layer three fragmentation turned out to be a really dumb idea, not a good idea. Now, what in IP version six, they use MTU discovery. If you try to send something to IP version six and some intermediate device cannot handle the packet size, it stops and sends a signal back to the source saying resend it with a smaller packet size. Instead of trying to break it up all by itself and pass it on so the source doesn't have to do that, which is what happens in IP version 4, which turned out to be a bad idea. The only reason this happened is because of Token Ring. Token Ring could handle 10 kilobyte frames, and Ethernet could only handle 1.5 kilobyte frames. So if you connected a Token Ring network to an Ethernet network, the big Token Ring packets could not move through the Ethernet network without breaking them up into eight packets each. So this fragmentation was for that. 
And people at the time imagined that there would be future layer two protocols of all different sizes and they had to have a general solution. And that totally did not happen. Ethernet won and it's all just Ethernet. But they didn't, they planned for an alternative, more complicated future that didn't happen. Anyway, um, IPv6 has a simplified header with much larger addresses, 128 bits, and a lot fewer of the fancy features that turned out to be unnecessary. So the IPv6 addresses look like this. FEC3QFF, FEC3, it's hexadecimal, so it's much easier to convert it to binary and figure out how many bits are on which side of uh, division lines and so on. Um, and like I say, MAC addresses are used to construct the host portion of the address. Um, the, one of the commonly used techniques puts your MAC address in the IP address now, and that is a privacy violation. All the public addresses start with two or three. The FE80 is a link local address used only on both wired networks. Um, this computer I did this on was not connected to the real IPv6 internet. Most companies and homes and everything are not yet using IP version 6, but Google upgraded to it several years ago and Comcast did too. So it's now up to the, I think 15 or 20% of people are actually using IP version 6 without realizing it. Um, but most people are still moving their stuff through IPv4. Uh, when IPv6 became popular about three or four years ago, um, their firewalls and network defense systems were mostly not IPv6 compatible. So in fact, you could break all the policies by using IPv6. That is beginning to get a little better, but um, I think it continues to be an issue that many, many uh, security engineers and network engineers do not understand IPv6. And if you don't, the, first, the only thing you need to learn is how to turn it off so people cannot use it on your network. And you don't want to turn it on until you have actually upgraded all your stuff and your knowledge to understand how to secure it. Anyway, um, you can disable it on an end device, just in your network properties on Windows if you want to, so your machine will stop using IP version 6. And uh, anyway, I used to teach an IPv6 certification class. That was good fun. But now it's included in normal Cisco certification and that plus and stuff. So it's not really necessary to have a separate class. The main point of that class was to learn all the strange transition technologies that mix the two together. And those are pretty much obsolete now that many people can actually get a real native IPv6 connection if they want it. Yeah. Um, so when I teach uh, IPv6, yeah. Yeah. I don't understand it. I go uncheck and have them disable it. And then when they go to recheck it, they're setting up properties in any way so it's not people. That's I've just encountered a lot of there are a lot of bugs in it. Uh, one thing that's crazy about IP version 6 is every device is multi-homed now. Every device has multiple addresses, which is one of the many bizarre, strange things about IP version 6. It would be okay if they were on the same network, but sometimes yeah. old addresses are on the network. Yeah, it even reaches the point where you might have multiple addresses on the same network, and now when you send a packet, you're not sure which one is the right from address, and there's even an RFC to tell you which from address to use when you have many. It's, it is... Very strange. That's why I taught the whole class in it, and there was a certification process. It's full of strange complexities. Far, it's not at all just making the addresses longer. There's a lot of new considerations when you go to IP36. So classable networks. First, the internet had only class A. The first byte was the network, and the rest were the hosts. Then they split it in 1981, uh, I think. They split it up to make to accommodate a larger internet. So they had class A, B, and C where you have um, half of the addresses used for class A, which were the first byte to time the network and the last three bytes determine the specific device on the network, and half of what's left for class B and half of what's left for class C, and class D and E that were hardly ever used at all. <clears throat> and that was used until 1993, when we, again, we ran out of an address space, so they had to subdivide it further and move to CIDR, and CIDR is the classless system that you used on the modern IP version for it where you allow all the slash numbers from slash one to slash 31 in principle. And so you can have networks of any size within factors of two. And this extends the total amount of usable addresses up to, I think, um, uh, some number, but it will totally exceed. I think the total, the total number of IP version four addresses is four billion. 
and this makes it possible to more efficiently use those. But the total number of devices connected to the internet is now something like nine or 10 billion. So we long ago exceeded the capacity of IP version four. But the fact is most people are sharing addresses with network address translation. But in fact, we're seriously running out. Um, the globe, there's five global lists of IP addresses and like three or four of them have now run out. North America ran out, I think in 2012. And uh, the only people has any left is like Africa. Asia ran out even earlier. So everybody has to pretty much move to IP version six, but adoption has been slow because most companies can still get what they need done over IP version four, and they really don't see a reason to invest in IP version six. And it really is quite difficult to upgrade to IP version six, far more difficult than you would think. There are a lot of considerations, both of functionality and security that require you to educate your staff quite a lot and change a lot of your devices. So it's uh, one of those painful transitions like in Linux, for example, we shouldn't be using IF config. It was deprecated 10 years ago. We're supposed to be using IP instead. We're not supposed to be using NetStat. All the tools we use every day were actually deprecated 10 years ago. Python 2 was deprecated long ago. We're all supposed to quit using it by HTML version 4. Everyone keeps using it anyway, including me, because it works fine. And just shut up with your new fancy thing. But, you know, the purists all say we're supposed to go to the next thing. And IP version 6 is the same. You should use this new baffling thing and say, oh, shut up. I'm busy. I got work to do. And IP version 4 is still good enough. <clears throat> anyway, so you got private addresses, the 10s, 172, 16, 172, 31, and the 192s reserved for private networks. If you try to send data to the internet with these addresses, it will just be thrown away. They're only used on private networks. Anyway, that's more of the net plus stuff, which we're all used to. And the uh, management type CISSPs have great suffering keeping all this stuff straight. So let's see if I, maybe this one will let me get it out of my favorites. Uh, why does that say one? My numbers aren't very good. Okay, this must be 4A2. 5A2, okay, I'm catching on. All right. I thought I had gone through these and corrected the numbers and apparently not. Anyway, we will cope. <laughs> All right, I think we got five cahooters. Okay, which layer uses segments as the protocol data? <laughs> TCP segments, layer four. Okay. Where are the 32 bit addresses? <coughs> That's IP4. We're best friend. Okay. What class is that address in? That's OpenDNS. A good number to memorize. Okay, that's uh, class C, good. And which addresses are 48 bits on? Mac addresses, IPv6 or 128 bit. All right, so good. So B is another three and Robert is another three and T, a new entry. All right, perhaps that's my remote attendee. Not obvious, could be. All right, anyway, so, um, well, it's 10, 11. I think we should just take a break um, and pick up at, I guess, 10, 25. Give you 15 minutes, walk around, get a cup of coffee or whatever you do. And I will stop the uh, share and restart another in 15 minutes at 10, 25. So I can put this video up.